Hello, everybody, and welcome back to That Milan Podcast. I'm Martino Puccio. Alongside me, Matt Santangelo. It's been, what, almost a week, 10 days since we last talked, uh, been on the mm-hmm. podcast. So a little bit to recap, but um, a string of positive results for Milan, um, which we'll get into. But uh, again, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. Um, and follow us on Spotify and Apple if you have not. That Milan Podcast and uh, on Twitter at That Milan Pod. Matt. How are you and how's everything been? I'm good. I'm good. We um, Earlier this week, we did lose our indoor final, which which stunk. Um, I forgot yeah. to ask. Night one, Chippy, two scandalous penalties. I don't want to get into it. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm doing good. Uh, as everyone knows, Milan dictates my mood on most days. And we got a victory. We're moving on. So I'm in a, I'm in a pretty good spot right now. Yeah, um, Milan get another victory after a, another red card early on in the game. Um, so again, Milan advanced to the quarterfinals today after beating Slavia Prague. Um, had a post-match discussing most of it. We'll, we're going to get into a good amount of it here in the podcast. It's not going to be a very long one, but in case you missed the immediate reactions, go to the YouTube channel and go and check out uh, under the live tab. Um, me just hanging out and chat for around 25 minutes. But anyways... Early enough red card after Milan looked like they would be conceding. Manjan made a great save, eventually had a collision that led him to get off the pitch, uh, which unfortunately for them saw him get substituted out. But there was an interview with him, uh, not an interview with him, but he was walking inside the stadium afterwards. A couple of reporters asked him how he was doing. He said he was fine. Um, So precautionary measure. Milan, again, they advanced 7-3 to on this aggregate. It really wasn't close at any moment in time. but. Gotta love the performance this go around up a man as opposed to last week. Absolutely. Um, night and day. I mean, I think there were, look, the first phase of this match, the first portion of this match, uh, Slavia gave us a little run, right? They gave us a they gave us a pretty good shot. Um, you know, they they were feeding off the home crowd, which is what Rens did. Um, they got an early goal. The difference is Milan were able to stave off that early pressure and eventually navigate into that part of the match where um, you know, the, the, between the injury with Magnon, the stopping and going there, and then eventually the red card for the tackle on Calabria, which I know people were a bit divided on. Um, it went to VAR. It was called a red. And I think from that point forward, I think it really put Milan in a position where they can spring forward, put this one to bed. And sure enough, um, you know, they could they create a goal. It's Pulisic, Ruben off chic shortly thereafter. Mm. Um, and then the icing on the cake was a, uh, a Rafa, world-class goal he was close many times in this match um there was some moments where you know yeah, he, he probably thought he could have had two to three in this one um mm-hmm. but for him to grab a goal and of course he got the assist him and uh Pulisic were you know uh, having really good days for us so all in all um a, a good performance for Milan um now I do want to point out that this performance over two legs um combining the two red cards from the first two legs this is an outlier. You're going to get teams that come up that come up against Milan that are going to be a little bit more compact, organized, less reckless and cynical, and they're going to be a little bit more calculated with their challenges, and they're not going to give you really much of anything. So um, I think Milan can play Roma, Atalanta, Bayer Leverkusen, Liverpool. They're, so they're pretty much playing, you know, the top teams during the quarterfinals here, right? So um, they have a long road ahead. A good result for Milan, no doubt. And um, you know, we'll wait and see what the draw has in store for us, and, and kind of go from there. Yeah, the draw is tomorrow. This is being recorded on Thursday evening. Milan have the opportunity of playing Atalanta, Roma, Leverkusen, Liverpool, Benfica, West Ham, or Marseille. Um, So again, quite a few teams on this list that Milan may not want to run into. Atalanta have had their number. Leverkusen and Liverpool are both the favorites in this competition. Our good friends uh, that have been on the state of play, including Adrian Rabona, of Benfica. I think Milan should be able to take care of a West Ham and a Marseille. They've handled Roma, but Mourinho's Roma, so they haven't faced him, obviously. They were the team that ended up getting him sacked. Mm. So, yeah, with that, I mean, again, the red cards are... It's kind of tough to, you know, dissect how Milan had played because of these red cards. You're not going to have that happen again. There was early, like, first half red cards in both legs. Um... Is there a team in Europe that has had to deal with like so many chaotic matches where there's multiple red cards or red cards early on in the match um, penalties being given like just, just so much drama all the time following this team. 
But again, today it was a lot more reassuring, especially with the starting midfield going with Musa and Adley. Not the greatest of performances from Yassine Adley, but at the end of the day, when you don't have to use that much of TG Reinders, when you don't have to really play Ismail Benacer, and you escape with a 3-1 win on the road, like uh, just really difficult to kind of get upset about it. Um, is it giving me a lot of confidence heading into the quarterfinals? I, I guess it would have to depend on the opponent, but we're really just talking about one more fixture before heading into the international break. Um, but Milan looking very good, helping Serie A on that uh, coefficient in Europe because the Champions League did not go well for a couple of people. But layout to Pulisic for this first goal. Um, I'm not sure how many people kind of noticed it, but there really wasn't that much attention on Pulisic after that red card. There was a lot of opportunity and time for him to have these one-on-ones on the right side of the pitch. They were far more concerned with Leao and Teo Hernandez, and rightfully so, just because of what that duo is. But the simple fact is this, Pulisic has scored in three straight games, and he's been contributing at a level that we haven't seen from a U.S. men's national team player um, in quite some time. I think this is honestly rapidly approaching, if it's not already, the greatest season of all time from, from an American in Europe in terms of goal contributions, the level of play in the Champions League, the Europa League, and obviously Serie A. So Pulisic has just been on fire, and for Rafa, again, just to be on the end of this. He had a hand in all three goals, um, but we'll talk about the first one. What a season Pulisic's been having, right? I mean, I think we we, we highlighted Leao at length over many podcasts, over many years, and we know how prolific he can be. We know how the numbers don't really truly tell the entire story of Rafa's season and the impact he's had, the missed chances, he could have more assists, you know, finishing needs some work, but his numbers maybe are not indicative of the type of season he's had and I think of the type of player he is. But when you look at the season that Pulisic's had, because I think the spotlight was on him coming into the season, um, at least when you're coming from, you know, an American background and, you know, American spaces when it comes to media, um, there's a lot of pressure. He was coming from Chelsea. He didn't really play that much. Um, There were questions and concerns about his injury record. Will he hold up? in a league like Serie A, which can be very daunting and physical for attacking players. I'm going to throw some stats out here, Martino. And it, this is actually probably going to be a really good clip. You can clip this if you want. Um, Christian Pulisic across all competitions in his first season in Milan. 2,762 minutes, 39 appearances, 12 goals, 8 assists. He's already statistically had his best season as a professional. Better than his Chelsea years. I know in 19, 2019, 2020, he was very impactful. Um, he had a really good second half in the COVID year, and, and he became a Champions League winner with Chelsea. But statistically, this is the best statistical season he's had when you combine his goal contributions, when you combine the fact that he's playing regularly. I know you talked about that at halftime spaces and even in your post-match. He's available. He's impactful. And you're starting to really, truly see a player – you know, take that next step and really start to sh- start to show those who are maybe critical and, you know, and not really, um, you know, backing his talent and what he's accomplished so far, seeing like, okay, he's doing this at AC Milan, he's playing a key role. And the one thing I started to notice too is, I don't know if you've picked this up, and I think I started to kind of, you know, map it out throughout the entire season, but you mentioned, you know, the focus layout, focus on, that left side, right? And that's always been a conversation for since those two have linked up at this club. But now you really, truly have to be respective of the impact that Pulisic can make. You mentioned the off the ball ability and the contributions. If he's not getting a goal or assist, he's doing a lot of the dirty work that is not tangible and not really documented in the stat sheet. But the way he crosses the ball and the way he gets, gets it into the box with both feet, the way he just finds himself floating and drifting into the right areas to get goals the first goal that he scored in this game or the the first goal for Milan was a very calm composed most players are going to take that on the first go and it's maybe going to get deflected they'll take a corner and they'll they'll move on Mm -hmm. the fact that he was able to receive that ball and like know that I got time here take that touch calmly put on his left not blast it and place it he's in very good form I think it's indicative of how much confidence he's playing with right now and Three straight games with a goal. I mean, 20 goal contributions and going. This is a player that can be 25 to 27 at the end of the season when we combine all competitions. So 
I mean, it's a great season for him. And this is, it, this is a dream scenario for any Milan fan that saw Pulisic enter Milanello. And they were like, we're just hoping he's healthy. I don't think anybody predict, predicted this, Martino, in his mm. first year. No, um, I think uh, uh, the the I don't know how I wouldn't say few, but the amount of Milan American fans or U.S. men's national team fans prior to this season, not yeah. not not our good friends that have joined us, um, to kind of like see this happen and transpire from it's really I guess the rumors were happening in June, right? And then you see him arrive in July. Mm -hmm. You're right, out of position on the right side playing in a physical league in this system where Milan have so many injuries, where we're having a conversation on a week to week basis. Please don't get hurt. Please don't get hurt. Please don't get hurt. And it's 20 gold contributions. This is the greatest American player to ever live. Um, and he's thriving at one of the biggest clubs in the world. Granted, they had a terrible crash out of the champions league. And again, on top of it are so far behind Inter. but speaking on an individual, he is, outperformed any Milan attacking right-sided player since I would say their Scudetto winning year in 2010, 2011, when it was Nopato, Zlatan, and Robinho all contributing. Like, he's better than Suso ever was. I mean, it goes without saying about Alexis Salamakers because mm -hmm. my tweet the other day in the conversation we were having was, okay, the worst we'll see of Christian Pulisic is kind of what we saw in the first leg of this tie where he's doing very good work off the ball, struggling to even get a shot on goal. And I know that was his only shot on goal because I bet on him to get one. And he didn't have one the entire match until he, quote-unquote, mm. robbed Rafa Leao of his. Yeah. Um, to make that sort of impact, even when things are not going well, the past two goals against Empoli and this one today were both taken on his left foot, both very smart runs. And then again, the patience, like you mentioned, is something that you know has paid off for him. And again, when teams are trying to overload on, on that left side and worry about, you know, one of the best left-sided duos in the entire world, one of the better and more underrated players in the entire planet, Christian Pulisic, is thriving on that right side. And I can't help but think and try and be optimistic towards the perspective of what happens when they get a striker that's going to score 25 goals? What happens when there's a midfielder that could slot in as the number six or even when he gets a player that is capable as a right back, because no yeah. disrespect to Davide Calabria and Florenzi and whatever Terraciano is going to be, they don't have a top tier right back. Um, so everything that Pulisic is doing is, is, is really like a lot harder in comparison in some aspects to these other players um, for Milan. So at the end of the day, I mean, this is by far um, a top two signing in Serie A. The only reason that it's not the best is because Toram and Inter are insane. Mm -hmm. So we're giving him his love, and it's great to see. And, oh, by the way, his backup is pretty damn good too because uh, Chukweze is, is definitely a capable player. Um, any other final notes on Pulisic before we go to uh, his number one enemy on the team, Rafael Leal? No, I mean, I think we kind of covered everything with him. He's having a, a great season, and – I think it's, you know, reflective of the work he's put in. And I think it's reflective of, you know, we have to give credit, right? Everyone talked about it's it's, it's not his natural position. Pioli's put him in positions where he's become our out-and-out -out right winger, and he's putting him in positions where he's taking on a big role, a lot of responsibility. And when it's not Rafa, it's Pulisic. When it's not Pulisic, a lot of times it's Rafa. And if you can get to your point, a striker that has more mobility, that can – sort of move around the box in the final third a little bit more than Giroud, I think you're going to have a more expansive approach to how you go at teams. And I think that just makes it a really interesting prospect, um, you know, for, for next season as well. Yeah, um, because when this player is striking the ball like that, few, and I mean this seriously, few are better in the world as a player. Um what he needs to do in terms of this consistency, because this is not something that's consistent of him. He scored this similar type of goal against Atalanta uh, in the Scudetto winning season. He has scored this one now. A couple now. weeks ago, too. Um, yeah, yeah. Just the overall capability that he has uh, mm -hmm. or the ceiling that this player possesses is mind-boggling. Um, and again, the second goal he had a huge involvement in. Um, Teo Hernandez grabbing that assist for Loftus-Cheek was great, but that layoff pass once again, he knows 
the chemistry between those two is just out of this world. So much but just, just having the ability and wherewithal of where he is on the pitch, how to perfectly lay it off. And, and Loftus-Cheek, again, by the way, if you see on the ticker on the bottom, that's nine goals for him. This guy is consistently producing. He has four goals in Europa League. Again, these are across all competitions on the bottom here, obviously, because Leao has 10 goals. doesn't have that in Serie A. Um, but, but with that, um, it just gets you excited because – the, the offensive capability of the squad is not within question outside of, you know, the strikers from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, just to, just to see this on full display, they're so threatening. Like, uh, like the pass is great. Pulisic got the assist on the layout goal, but I mean, that was all him. That finish was top bins. Like that's, that's insane. Like it, it was outrageous. And just to, see that and it really put the game to bed at that point um it was seven to two after that three three nil up on the road at the half up a man like that's the dagger um especially with a goal like that that just sucks the life out of you because you know slavia Prague. that's not really a side that would be giving up i think they're actually quality i just don't think that they had the ability to show it because of their situations yeah um but yeah man i mean again when the weather starts warming up, so does Rafael Leao. Uh, it just every single time that it's starting to turn into spring, this is the home stretch where he turns it up. Scudetto winning year, turned it up. Last year, again, there was no trophies met with it, but he was sensational down the stretch for Milan. Um, and again, you see it here. Like this player, man, like it's just, he, he is sensational. And there's no question, like since Lathan left the, the first time around, this is the guy, this is the best player. I'm running out of superlatives for Rafa. I mean, I think, you know, look, we 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 talked about, you know, his stats don't tell the to the whole story. Um, and he's even been publicly explaining how, you know, the, this the game is so stats driven and there's a lot more joy and love. And I'm paraphrasing it, that you know, passion he gets from this game beyond the, the stats, and that's what he you you could tell, right? Like when he plays, you know, he may not get a goal, and sometimes it could be frustrating. But it's a player that generally goes out there and has fun. You know, it's a job for a lot of players, and they they detach from the sport once they step off the pitch. But you can tell Rafa generally loves this game, and he's having fun out there. And when he's having fun and he's up for it, that's when you're getting his best his best self. And, you know, that's a great goal. I mean, I think that's a goal that it was coming, you know, in many ways like that, um, that goal against Renda, the end-to-end -end where he really wasn't all that – he was coming off the injury. He was banged up a little bit. You know, gets a great goal. The game against Atalanta, another great goal. He's always been a player um, that that knocks, 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 and then he gets that one goal that, like, kind of wows you and makes you jump out of your seat. And he's been doing that a little bit more lately, which is encouraging because it started off the season slow from a you know goal-scoring standpoint. So if Milan are getting peak Rafa and, you know, second half of the Scudetto-winning season Rafa – and they can carry that forward, not so much in Serie A. I mean, I think he'll be able to do what he does normally, but be able to translate that and keep that going, um, you know, deeper into this Europa League. I think that's what really is going to have a lot more people and a lot more attention on Rafa because, you know, this, to your point, since Ibrahimovic left, it's his team. You have Giroud, you have some guys that are good players, no doubt, but it's it's obvious. He's wearing the number 10. He got the big contract. He's the star player on this team. He's the marquee man on, on, on the roster. So if he's able to play to this level and have one of those stretches where he's carrying Milan, um, at least from like taking the game by the scruff, getting the big goals, mm -hmm. having the big moments, and truly being at the very heart of victories that go deep into this competition, I think that will go a really long way for those who are maybe skeptical on him or maybe not a little bit down on him because he hasn't had, again, the statistical season that stacks up to his previous ones. I think he can do a lot in these last batch of games, um, both in Serie A and Europa League, to kind of further cement and establish himself as a premier top, top player that we all know he is. But I think that, you know, he plays with this kind of chip on his shoulder too because I think he kind of reads into what people are maybe are saying and he wants to continue to perform at a higher level. And he knows the responsibility he has to do that being the number 10 for Milan. Yeah. Um, again, this is just somebody that consistently grows. To see this growth from the first season where Giampaolo was the manager up until now has been immense. Um, 
honestly, like as, as a fan of the club, really hard to remember what it's been around 20 years or so kind of harder back then considering access to games, how old I was um, to see this growth of a player from beginning to up until now. Yeah. And I still don't even think he's reached that ceiling. We'll find out within the next couple of years to see, you know, cause eventually like you stagnate, but if he could put together one season that I'm not saying he's on his level, but what Vinny jr. Does at real Madrid, you put him in serious conversations. We'll see. It's a big summer coming up for him. Um, and again, with this competition, his comments after the game uh, were just reminiscent of, I want to win this competition. Um, we're focused on that. It's realistically the only thing that they could win at this point. Um, can Milan do it? Leverkusen, still undefeated. Unbelievable how they came back against Karabag. I, I don't see us beating them or even... Liverpool at this rate with the way we've been playing and how the defense is. Um, but I think they could beat anybody else and knock on anyone else in this competition. I think Milan being the third favorites is fair enough. I think the, the who we draw in the quarterfinals is going to say a lot. And I think in many ways, you know, look, people diminished and downplayed and discredited what we did last year and how far we went in the Champions League. And they were saying, well, you got drawn with this team. You got drawn with that team. Whatever the case, I think Milan, you know, if they want to win this competition, they still have to get a little, a little bit of that luck when it comes to draws. I know they don't haven't gotten it in the Champions League because they had the group a couple years ago and they returned where it was Liverpool, Atletico, and Porto. Then, you know, last year was more favorable. And then this year, of course, was a group of death, right? So the Champions League, as far as draws are concerned, haven't been too favorable to Milan. But, you know, getting Rennes, Slavia Prague, if they're able to get no offense to these teams, but Marseille or a Benfica versus getting a Liverpool or Bayern by Leverkusen. And you find a way to get past them when you got, you know, all your guys back and you're playing some decent football, at least, you know, results wise, we're able to scrap and get results. We're not on the losing side of these matches so far. Then you find yourself in a semifinal where look, if you have, if you, over two legs, anything could happen. So, I mean, I yeah. think that that's going to really dictate a lot is who we get drawn with in the quarterfinals. I think if it's a favorable matchup, then I think people can start kind of buying into it because you get to a semifinal, you have your guys back, you're in good form, and you can potentially make it happen. But I think if we're talking, Martino, about you know how Milan stack up against the pack in the field, they're probably still a third team. I still think you have to respect Bayer Leverkusen and the fact that they have that comeback kid mentality in them. They just don't lose. They literally I mean, have this is, no, yeah, they've and entered. Have who are in in a, a, a tight race for the title with City. And Arsenal. So, like, it's going to take a lot, but I think they are they still have to, you know, dream and obviously go for it. You so. have to hope that Liverpool put in their resources, if they're still in this in the race, that they put in their resources towards the Premier League title. Even their which second is just, still strong, too. Which is just yeah, – it's an incredible race. It's an incredible – it's an all-timer, honestly. Yeah. It's going down to the final 10 matches there. Um, Leverkusen is this super special team that we're going to be talking about 20, 30 years from now. And what they did, what they've done to Bayern Munich. Just to, we're, we're, it's March 14th. They haven't lost a fucking game. Like, that's, do people understand that? This is Bayern Leverkusen. couple games, they've been down a couple goals and have come back and won. It's, they, like, this they entire huge. time, this entire tie against Karabag, they were not the better team. It, it no. took until stoppage time for Patrick Schick, shout out Serie A legend, um, to turn this around and, yeah. and win. It, granted, they got a red card too, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it's you're down 2 0, it's 4 2 on aggregate just absolutely that's, that's, the mark of, that's the mark of a really good team too is when you over two legs you have a team that clearly is, was oh, the better crazy. side and they're still winning games and they're still winning games Scary. your champions have right. to have that it, it can't become your dna it can't become the standard but it says a lot when you know your players are injured and you're not playing your best football you're down 2-0 and you somehow win because we've seen what this team looks like when they have their foot on the gas and they're going I mean, they've had matches where they look like one of the best teams in football. And then matches like this where they look like they shouldn't be in a knockout round of a competition and they're still winning. So it's going to be very scary for whoever gets them because chances are they're not going to play two bad legs against you. 
Yeah. Like I would be stunned if they're able to do this again. Whoever and they, they don't, and they don't kind of really have to worry about Bundesliga. And again, no. what some people forget, Bundesliga is an 18-team league. They don't have 38 matches. They're going down to 34. It's getting very close to the end yeah. of that season. They have around a 10-point lead over Bayern. Bayern might even just focus on the Champions League now. We'll see what happens with the draw tomorrow. Hopefully, it goes into Milan's favor. Again, you have to you have to beat the best to be the best. So can't complain on whoever they draw. We'll see what happens there. Uh, this weekend, speaking of the best, this is the opposite. Verona. Um, listen, this was not a pretty one the first time we faced them earlier this season, but we got the result. This was when Yunus Musa played a pretty sound match. He had a start in this one. I believe Chukweze also started. Um, listen, Milan want to guarantee this Champions League spot. And again, not a guarantee for Italy to have five Champions League spots, especially after what we just saw in the Champions League um, mm -hmm. with Inter, Napoli, and Lazio, and then ourselves crashing out of the group. Um, this is big. Milan have to continue to grab these points against inferior sides. What is your hopeful lineup? I mean, Florenzi was suspended for the last two matches against Empoli, and obviously today I think he should get the start. I think he's been playing better than Calabria. I'm not fully convinced that Pioli will do that. I think Tamore and Gabia once again should get that start. Have Teo there. I think Benacer and TG Reinders start back in. Um, and then again, you'll probably see a, a Loftus cheek up top with Giroud, Leal, and Pulisic again um, because they want to seal off these three points. And very important as well, as we know, international break right around the corner. How are you feeling heading into this one? I feel pretty good. I mean, look, the the I can't say we're going to come out here and play silky champagne football. That's just not us. We haven't shown that really that often this entire season. Um, so if people are asking for Milan to play that brand of football, that caliber of football, and wipe Verona off off the pitch, it's probably not going to happen. They can still win the game hand the comfortably. But if you're expecting a 4-5-0 drubbing, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, Verona are a team that, you know, they're in that kind of batch of teams that are fighting for relegation. And, you know, until the final day comes and they're mathematically eliminated, you can't rule anything out. So playing these teams at this point of the season can be very tricky. Um, so I think that you, you Milan need to play their best team, uh, maybe with the occasional player rotated from today. Absolutely. But I think that, look, Milan are going to get a result here. Um, I think that it's not going to be fantastic. I'm not going to sit here and, and, and bitch and moan uh, any further. We all kind of know what this team is this year, this version under Pioli is, and what they what they aren't. And I just want to win games at this point. Whatever the season position holds for us at the very end, with the league, with the Europa League, it's, it is what it is. But I think at the end of the day, we have a batch of games left. Let's just get results. Let's finish as high as we can on the table, go as far as we can as Europa League, and you revisit and you reassess what the future holds for the coach and for the rest of the squad. So um, I'm predicting 2-0. I think we'll play a pretty – I think we'll play a pretty clean game. I don't think it's going to be, again, like a dominant game, but I think Milan have shown that they'll take their chances. We create a ton. I, I don't want to see anybody tweet at me ever again and – just in general, how we don't create a ton of chances. We don't convert as many as we should. In a match like this, it should have been 3-0 before it was 3-0. Yeah. Like, that's the type of team we are. We go through matches where 15 to 20 minutes, we look like we can't even retain possession. We can't even complete a couple passes in a row. That's how I feel like most of these games are going to go. But I think Milan are going to play a pretty clean game um, this weekend, and we'll, and we'll get a result that we need uh, to, to help us finish second. So just to give the lineup of what we fielded last time we faced Verona, Sportiello in goal, three at the back with Kier, Tomori, and Chow. Um, Yunus Musa was on the right side of the midfield. It was Musa, Krunic, Reinders, and Florenzi um, all together. So Florenzi was behind Leal. There was no Teo Hernandez. Uh, and then up top, it was just Pulisic, Giroud, and then Leal. Leal scored the goal in that one. That was that goal that he last scored up until yeah. recently in Serie A. Um, jeez. Mm. Uh, no Henry, Henri for uh, Verona because of uh, the last match. I don't know if anybody saw, but former Diversa. former Lecce manager Diversa headbutted Henri. Um, so total chaos there. Verona spiraling out of control. Maybe Filippo Filippo Terracciano gets to face his old side. Uh, you know, maybe a little substitute on there. Um, 
real quick, I just kind of want your final thoughts on the Empoli match. Uh, good to see Pierre Kalulu come back in. Yes? Of course. I mean, it's we've been waiting for this for the entire season, right? When we were down three defenders. We were down Chow, Kalulu, Tamori. Or like 10, but yeah. It, 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 yeah, like it, we've been waiting for this. And to see some of these guys just step on a pitch, let alone put forth a good performance. Um, Malik Chow hasn't put forth a good performance. He still looks lost out there. But it's just great to see some of these players – healthy we have options to choose from and we don't have to yep. play Teo as an emergency center back we don't have to play Florenzi in the defense like it's 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 refreshing to see these guys come back especially a lot of the younger players when you're out for a substantial amount of time like they are you know it's it's just great to see them on the field so you know beyond the results you want to see guys come back and as we mentioned Martino this is we we, we started to kind of project where and what part of the season we were going to get most of our guys back Milan are in second place. They're headed to the quarterfinals of the um, champ uh, not Champions League, Europa League. I wish it was Champions League. Um, mm -hmm. And it's mid-March, and they have, by all accounts, pretty much their entire team available to them. You know, yeah, Outside of Pobega, yeah. Outside of Pobega, who hasn't really been used anyway. So yeah. I'd sign up for that. You know, Obviously, I'd love to be in first, but the fact that we're healthy at this part of the season is absolutely crucial for us to attain the the objectives that we that we want yes um yeah now that now that i think about it you mentioned uh youth um shout out to the youth team getting to yeah. the um champions league semi-final of the youth champions league semi-final knocking out real madrid on penalties hey florentino Barrett, we said we were their number one rivals so to eat that barcelona and the rest of the footballing <laughs> world um, and actually one more final note, because we were getting a lot of questions about this and I'll address this mostly. And I, and whatever you have learned about the situation and know about it, um, regarding Redbird and Casa Milan getting raided by financial authorities, um, to put it into perspective for most of the people who don't really follow much of Italian news, um, because a lot of it is dramatic. A lot of it is sensationalized. It's not really mm -hmm. always factual, um, especially with a lot of the sources. So I understand where there was some cause for concern from a lot of U.S. men's national team fans that have kind of jumped on board to this club. Um, listen, this is all sensationalized, as I said. This has been known for quite some time, how Milan have been sold to Redbird. Uh, the initial agreement of the sale was in May, uh, right when they won the Scudetto, and it wasn't initially finalized until fall of that year in September, where we knew Redbird would take over. Um, and again, there was a large vendor loan, which we have also discussed uh, on our previous videos. So go and check that one out, where we're talking about the potential future sale of Milan, which is more than likely to happen within the next two years, especially uh, by next World Cup. I mm -hmm. definitely foresee that happening. Um, and so with that, Elliot, we're the ones who gave out the loan. Listen. Jerry Cardinal is no is an idiot when it comes to finances, okay? This guy used to work at Goldman Sachs for a very long time. He is not a moron when it comes to this. He's not going to do anything illegal. He's not going to do anything um, reckless at the same time, right? He is going to put the club in the best position possible, not only for them to compete, and unfortunately, we're not seeing any massive success, but with that, he's also putting them in, in areas where he's going to have them fine fiscally, and we've seen that. And, yeah. and it's been repeated and it's something that you and I have talked about all the time. I wouldn't even worry about it, any penalties for Milan regarding Europe, regarding Serie A, points deduction, any of the stuff that you saw happen with Juventus. Um, the financial authorities, just from what I understand and everything that I've seen from Antonio Vitiello, Raimondo, um, I tweeted out uh, an article yesterday that Ali Fisher translated all the details, details about this. They have no idea what they're investigating. They have no idea what they're upset about or what they want to go after Milan for. Um, the fact is this. There is definitely some smoke to the fire of a sale. Um, and again, I, I, I don't expect Redbirds to be the owners of AC Milan come the 2026 World Cup. That is from everything I read. That is from everything I know. And, and logically, what makes sense? For a hedge fund to want to flip something in an asset like this um, is crucial to them. So. Getting the San Donato land. By the way, there's updates on that. Go on SemperMilan.com for that as well. So a lot more land than people realize that was purchased. So building that stadium there. We'll see what kind of investors come along. And again, these documents were discovered um, when there was a potential negotiation of the sale with PIF being involved. 
but also other Middle Eastern funds um, that people don't know the names of. So that's what it's been classified as and all we could really say. Um, yeah, so so with that, um, I wouldn't worry, guys. It's going to be okay. Um, Milan are in good hands financially. We'll see what happens with a sporting project. The main concern right now, finishing top four in Serie A, primarily second place. Um, if Inter were to ever slip up, it's the greatest collapse of all time, but I digress. Um, and again, on top of it, hopefully winning Europa League. Those are the only things that matter at this moment mm-hmm. in time. Um, so don't concern yourselves. Don't panic. Uh, there's a lot of BS coming out of Italy all the time. I think this is just another one of those scenarios. Uh, final thoughts, Santangelo, before you plug your stuff, we have your beautiful handle up right there. Uh, yeah, just real quick off the back of what you just discussed. Um, I'll be honest with you. I saw the news. I didn't really comment too much on it because, again, I think the sensationalism and all that sort of nonsense and all the, 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 the sources that were coming out with this information and everyone's kind of, of it made sense. I didn't even react to it. I didn't flinch because, frankly, I think we've become numb to these sorts of things as Milan fans. We, we experienced the Yong Hong Lee era and how – Milan so were much, it was so much worse. Like, yeah. like, come on, like the the videos, if you know the, the the trolling about the type of suits he would wear and the the office when how he didn't iron his suits and how right, you know, most of that money was from like it's just it's it, just it, you know. I didn't I didn't even think anything about it and I think like if you know some people trolled and bantered and all that stuff I, I'm I'm in the same camp as you, Martin. I'm, Pretty calm about everything. You know, obviously, we've discussed a potential sale in previous episodes, as Martino mentioned. Go check that out. The The focus is on the on, on the results on the pitch and these two composition, competitions that we're currently uh, engaged in. So um, follow me on Twitter, at Matt underscore Santangelo. Um, and yeah, thank you, everyone, for the support. Obviously, also for Martino when he goes live and does the halftime spaces. Um, we really do appreciate it. Like. Subscribe, follow on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, all that good stuff. And um, thank you guys again. Yeah, uh, at Martino Pucci everywhere um, for all your information. We appreciate you guys so much. Again, audio, video, um, like, comment who you want to face in Europa League. Uh, comment on who you think the worst newspaper is in Italy and why they always spew nonsense. I'm very interested in that because there's a lot of them out there. Um, and again, um, brighter days are ahead. Make no mistake about it. Um, I fully believe in that. And a lot of people like to call me a pessimist, but that's outside of these things. But anyways, we appreciate you. Like the video. Please subscribe. Um, Other than that, thank you, audio friends, for all your support. Um, We have eclipsed 150 followers there. Uh, So kudos to you. Uh, Thank you once again, and uh, take care, guys.